Good morning. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The title of the sermon this morning is My Prayer for You. It's going to come from two prayers that we're going to look at specifically in the book of Ephesians. Welcome back, campers and staffers. Glad that you're back. I'm sure you had a wonderful week and it's going to take some time to recover, but uh, I know that's always an encouraging time. Glad that you're with us. I heard you studied a lot on prayer, and so today's lesson is going to be on prayer. And by the way, uh, we're going to start announcing it. It's in the update, but we're having a meeting with Edwin Crozier on prayer, uh, August 29th through September 1st. So start putting that in your calendar now and planning for that and praying about that. So good to be with you. One of the, one of the things that I see when I'm looking at this, these two prayers is that sometimes my prayers haven't looked like that. It's not that we don't pray for our physical health. It's not that we don't pray for those who are traveling. It's not that we don't thank God for our food. It's not that we don't pray for our physical rulers. All of those things we're told to do and we see done in the Bible. But what if I pray for my health or we pray for someone else's health, and that never changes. In fact, it gets worse. Let me ask you something. Is God still good? Is he still powerful? What if you pray for a relationship to change, and it never changes? Is God still good? Is he still powerful? It could be our relationships, it could be our money, it could be our job situation. Again, it could be our health. There could be a lot of things that we pray about. Paul prayed for people's sicknesses. We see that in Philippians chapter 2 on behalf of Epaphroditus. But what I see here in these two prayers in Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3 are prayers about what happens in the inner man that is far more important, far more lasting of far more value than asking God to change my physical circumstance. We may pray for situations to change and God may say no, but we have to trust that he has a reason for that. But I'm going to tell you because God tells you there are prayers he's going to say yes to. He tells us in James chapter 1, verse 5, if you pray for wisdom, he's going to give it to you. Are you with me? And if we pray for God's power and his love and his understanding to be brought within us, to change us from the inside out, he is going to say yes to that prayer. And so even as our bodies decay, our inward man is being renewed day by day, Paul said. Even as Paul was mistreated, he was mistreated, he was abused, he was falsely accused. Yet he recognized there was something greater going on spiritually in his life and around the brethren, Philippians chapter 1. So there are three main points in the sermon this morning. My prayer for you, which I think is Paul's prayer for you, is number one, that you will understand how richly blessed you are in Christ. The second thing is that you will comprehend, that I will comprehend the power and the depth and the working of God's love and what that does inside of us. And then thirdly, that you will have a relationship with Jesus not just a religion. So the first point. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, we'll read in just a moment. But it's like someone called it one of the greatest run-on sentences ever written. Paul knew how to write long sentences. And 
There's a great example of that here in Ephesians chapter 1. But if you look at the Ephesians book as the letter as a whole, now again, it didn't have, we say this, it didn't have chapter divisions when it was first written. But chapters 1 through 3 kind of tell us the calling, the why. The what, what God has done for us and why. And then there's an application section to chapter 4, verse 1, walk worthy of that calling. And then there's a practical application of, okay, if you understand chapters 1 through 3, that's going to change everything about the way I think, the way I behave, the way I talk, my relationships, whether it's a master servant or a husband and wife, parents and children brothers and sisters in Christ, it's going to change as we walk worthy. And there's several walks there in chapters 4 and 5 that are based on what we understand here in these first three chapters. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through, uh, 3 through 14 are like uh, an overture. I remember watching you know, cartoon, uh, Disney cartoons, and, and of course we watch so many with the kids, Disney and Pixar, I'm sure many of you have too. More, more times than you want to. But some of those old Disney movies like Robin Hood, you know, if you're watching the old Disney cartoon Robin Hood at the beginning, it's what's called an overture. There's a song at the beginning that's a combination of all the other songs at the end of the book or throughout the, I mean, throughout the rest of the movie. And so all of the songs in the movie, there's little snippets of it taken and that's at the beginning. It's called an overture. And that's what we have here, Ephesians chapter 1 is little snippets what we're going to see more about in the rest of the book. And they're combined here in this, prayer, in this statement, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. So what I want you to do is think about how blessed you are in Christ. This was a poor church, most likely. It was a church that was persecuted Paul said that, the, that there were many adversaries at Corinth If you read in, in Ephesus. When he read, I'm, I'm struggling today. When he wrote 1 Corinthians, he was writing from Ephesus. And at the end of, of that book, he says, I'm in Ephesus and I want to stay here because there's been a great and effective door opened and there are many adversaries. He figuratively fought with beasts at Ephesus, whether figuratively or literally. He, there is a hard road a uh, hard road here in Ephesus, but they're blessed. If I was to ask you, are you blessed? Would you automatically think about your physical things? Well, I'm blessed to have a car. Yeah, you're blessed. I'm blessed to have health. Yeah, I'm thankful for that. What if I don't have any of that? Are you blessed? See, all these blessings that we see here in verses 3 through 14 have really nothing to do with our health, our wealth. This really destroys the health and wealth gospel. The name it and claim it gospel. You're blessed because you have these things. In verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He, by the way, is writing from prison in Rome. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The heavenly places, you see this several times in the book of Ephesians. It's where we're blessed. It's the spiritual realm. Uh, we, we see that it's where blessing is, chapter 1, verse 3. It's where Christ's authority, where he reigns. He reigns over the heavenly places in chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. It's where we have security because we are now raised up from death, from our sins, to sit in the heavenly places in Christ. So Jesus says all of these blessings are in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly places where Christ reigns, where I'm raised up to sit, where the church, chapter 3 and verse 10, declares God's wisdom and eternal purpose. And also in chapter 6, verse 12, where the battle is waged. So I have my security, my purpose, the reign of Christ, the blessings, everything's in the spiritual realm. And we may be standing on Beaumont's soil, but we are in our minds in the heavenly places. 
I hope that's true for you. To have our minds in the heavenly places. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You can read more about our trespasses in chapter 2. As he writes those first few verses of there's a contrast between God and us. This is you, this is God. We were walking just like everybody else, chapter 2 says. You think, well, that criminal is bad. That murderer is wrong. That person's bad. You're bad too. We have all trespassed. We have all crossed the line. We have all broken God's law. We have all been unholy. We all stand condemned before God. And we are by nature children of wrath, just like everybody else. And God in his rich love and his mercy said, I'm going to forgive you of all of your trespasses. Is that a blessing? Which he, notice this, verse 8, considering who you are and what you have done, because you know that and God knows it. How is his attitude toward grace in spite of what you have done to him, in spite of you being an enemy of his, as it said in chapter 2? What did he do? He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things, Jews and Gentiles, all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. I like that idea of lavish. I'm just getting started on this grandpa journey and I'm, I'm ready to lavish. You know, every time I just Levi, I got a little picture of Levi, my grandson on my desk. You know, I just want to give him everything. Well, that's my grandson. You would expect that, right? Who did God lavish upon? The enemies, the sinners, the trespassers, the violators of his will, the unholy. He said, I want to lavish upon you my grace. I want to forgive you so I can just pour it all out on upon, upon you. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We don't deserve that. Verse 11, you have an inheritance. Maybe, not, maybe you're not expecting, I, I don't know, maybe in your life, maybe you have a, someone when they pass away, you're going to receive this big inheritance. But there's a lot of people when they, someone else has died, you're not going to get this windfall cash. But do you have an inheritance? Are you with me? Do you have an inheritance? We have an inheritance. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having be, been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, I think meaning here the Jews, there's a we-you comparison in chapters 1 through 3, we the Jews, you the Gentiles, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory, in him also when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, underline that, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, how can we walk away from that and say we're not blessed? We are chosen by God. Not that he chose me versus my neighbor. He chose a plan. Us in him. He chose us in him. We are chosen to be blameless before God. That means all of our sins, all of our defilements, all of our disgustingness before God. He is removed so that we can be before him blameless. What has sin done? Genesis chapter 3. It has separated us from God. It has made us dirty in this world and defiled and, and, and just it's a painful existence sometimes because of the sin that's in the world. 
He's coming to remove that. That we can be adopted as God's children. You know, I was thinking about a, a person that I know from another state who they were having trouble having kids. And they went through the process of adoption. And I've heard this story now repeatedly over and over again. But they went through the process of adoption and they started to have their own children. Well, they go see somebody and somebody say, well, which one of these are your kids? They're all my kids. And you think about God says, I adopted you. You're mine. What if your family wants nothing to do with you? Are you blessed? What if your parents forsake you? Are you blessed? You have an inheritance in Christ. And Christ is the inheritance. We have been forgiven. We have been redeemed. We have been made to know God's eternal plan. God wants us to know. He wants to enlighten us. So we think about all of that. But verse 14, I think about how the Holy Spirit was given to each Christian. People debate that. But I wish we just stop and say, thank you, God, for giving us the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that I can have this, the, the Holy Spirit within me as a guarantee did you say guarantee? How many times Christians are walking around saying, well, I hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. I hope I don't mess up at the last second. Good night. What did we just read? Yes, we have our responsibility. Yes, I know the Bible says we can walk away from God. But God doesn't want us to walk around in, in eternal insecurity. I hope I said that right. It sounded good coming out, but I don't know. Verse, Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. The reason why I say that is because Anna afterwards sometimes like, Aaron, you said this. Like, no, I didn't. I'll go back and replay it. Oh, yeah, that's what I said. Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. Now let's look at Paul's first prayer. I want you to understand how richly blessed you are. Second point is I want you to comprehend the depths of God's love and power working in you. I would encourage us. I know other people have said some of these same things. But God has given us great prayer manuals. Great pre-written prayers. You can take this section and put somebody's name in it. You can put your child's name in this. You can put your spouse's name in this. You can put your name in this. But Paul is thinking about these things on behalf of these brethren in Ephesus. For this reason, verse 15, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That you'll have lots of money? No. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened to open my blind eyes. The eyes that become darkened through the world, Ephesians 4, to have them renewed and opened where I can see clearly, see the way God wants me to see, to be enlightened so that I may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. What kind of power? According to the power of his working might that he worked, verse 20, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I pray and you pray tonight. Let's take this prayer and let's pray this for people. Probably pray this for our enemies too, couldn't we? Maybe they could open up their eyes. We can pray this for our children. We can pray this, as I said, for our grandchildren. We can pray this for our, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we want God, God Paul wants God, to, for their eyes to open up, to see how rich we are, the hope we have. Because 
as I look at the blessings of life, like the Jewish people in the Bible, I think the blessings of life mean, well, we've got fields full of grain and, and we've got, you know, vats full of wine and we've got all this oil and all this blessings. That's what we see. Well, what if that's all gone? What do you have left? And you look at this. This was a poor church. This was a persecuted church, but they had every spiritual blessing in the, high, in the places in Christ. So we want to comprehend the depth of God's power working in us. Have you watched, I know you have, some of you have, have you watched God work within somebody and do amazing things? Have you watched you and what he's done to you? The same power that rose Jesus from the dead, you talk about there's not much more hopeless condition than being dead. You're dead. He raised him from the dead. That's the same power he's working within you because you're dead. We were dead without Christ. Let's read the second prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. Again, another great pre-written prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying pre-written prayers. Read the Psalms. They're great prayers. Just use them before God, okay? Psalm, or Ephesians 3, verse 14 through 21. Another prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And that leads us into that third point together. But the Father, there's my relationship from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, there's relationship that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit, where? In your inner being, so that Christ, not just, he talks about the Holy Spirit, he talks about the Father, he talks about Christ, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded in love. When you are being pulled apart by crisis, when you are being pulled apart by the trials of life, when you are being uh, whipped around by the storms of life, there is something that holds you down and anchors you. I pray, he says, that you will be rooted and grounded in God's love. And that you may have the strength to understand, to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth of and length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Now, verse 20. I've seen this illustration several times, you know, just over the years, but God here through Paul really goes to great lengths to show how much God can do for us. We see now to him who is able to do all that we ask or think. Right? There's more there. God is able to do all we ask or think. Yes, he is able to do far more than we ask or think. He is able to do far more abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power at work where? within us. I can't get over this temptation. Well, who was that about? That was about you. Yes, you can if God's working his power within you. I don't think I can ever forgive that person. God says, I rose Jesus from the dead and my power is working it in you. Can you? Should you? Should we? I don't know. However, I can stand up after all of this overwhelming grief, God raised Jesus from the dead and his powers that work in you. I don't know how I can ever overcome this anxiety and depression. You may have it, face it the rest of your life, but God can give you the power to walk through it. God is with us as he walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23. And remember that we don't stay there. We walk through it. I want you to think about having a relationship with Jesus, not a religion. And I know sometimes in the world that may be twisted around to saying, well, I need Jesus. I don't need the church. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Bible says. You know, I need Jesus. I don't need rules. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Bible says. 
But what I am saying is what James 1, 26, 27 says. And I encourage you to turn there with me. James 1, verses 26 and 27. Understand what pure religion is. This is one example. And as you're turning there, if you're taking notes, another example is Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Matthew 15, 7 through 9, where he's like, you guys, your lips are drawing near to me, but your heart is far from me. Thank you for worshiping me, worshiping me, but I want your heart. I want a relationship with you. I don't want you to just come follow rules and take a little snippet of cracker and grape juice. I want you to have a relationship with me, God says. I'm your father. Okay? He wants us to, to have that relationship and to be called by his name. James 1 and verse 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is vain, worthless, right? God says, okay, you think you're religious, but you really don't have a relationship with me, and clearly you don't have a relationship with other people. Your religion is vain. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Relationship. Relationship with God. The two greatest commands are right there in that verse. To be unstained from the world, that means you have a relationship with God and you are caring for the helpless. And that means you have a relationship with other people. That's pure religion. I think, well, my religion's pure. I, I come on Sunday. I take the, the crackers and grape juice. I sing the right songs. I wear my nice suit. God says there's more to it than this, isn't there? And so as we think about this, I just want to encourage you as we close, as we prepare for our final song, or the song. I said this the other day, and there's, going to be, there's probably going to be another sermon on it, but if I were to ask you, can you think of five promises, five promises that apply to the New Testament Christian? I want you to think about that. Maybe we'll put it on Facebook or something. I don't know. We'll talk about it. But I want you to think about five promises that belong to the New Testament Christian. Because as we think about this, knowing how richly blessed we are, comprehending the depth of the power, having a relationship with Jesus, when everything is breaking apart, what are we going to hold on to? It's not going to be our money. It's not going to be our intellect. It's not going to be our relationships necessarily. It's going to be holding on to Jesus Christ. And that is based on the promises he's given us. And if you have memorized all the Bible facts, but have forgotten the promises of God, I think you need to work on working on the promises of God a little bit more. So as you're thinking about that, we'll talk about it more. But if you are outside of Jesus Christ, say, I need to become a Christian. If you need to become a Christian today, if you believe that Jesus is the risen Lord and you want to have that relationship with him, believe in him, trust in him, that what he says is right. He is the risen Lord and he's reigning in the heavenly places and God can take you, wash you as you're baptized into Christ, cleansed by the blood of Jesus, raised to walk in those heavenly places. Think about those things. Come forward while we stand and sing.